No, but I, I do believe, though, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things to debate about, yeah. right? There's a lot of things to debate about, but at the end of the day, does it really matter? Ooh. Does it really matter if an iPhone is better than an Android? Yeah. Is it really, does it really matter who wins the NBA championship? Yes. Does it really matter what sport's better, soccer or football? Yes. You know, you may say yes, but at the end of the day, it really does not matter. Because it's all about your opinions and what you desire. And tonight, we're going to see what does God desire. Let's go to Acts chapter 19. You know, you're probably, you're probably like wondering, well, bro, why do you start off with us debating? Is debating a godly thing? Well, let's see what Paul did in the Bible. Acts 19, let's look at verse 8. All right, verse 8, the Bible says, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively. persuasively. So what is he doing right now? He's debating right now. He's persuading people to follow the truth. And let's see, let's see what he says about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. So all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So what do you see from Paul? Did Paul love debating? Yes. yes. What is debating? Arguing persuasively. He's going around town, every city, and he's trying to get people to buy in to the truth about God's kingdom. See, when you have a passion about it, you want to talk about it. Did we just see some good examples up here where people have passion about something? But imagine when somebody's on fire for God, what do you think is going to come out of their mouth? The very word of God. And it says that Paul went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Well, that's the place where people would go to learn. Wow. Well, what would you call that nowadays? College. The universities. Wow. Well, why did Paul go there? Because that was the future. Wow. He's looking for leaders that want to be trained and learn the truth and be convinced of it. Wow. See, when you're convinced of something, don't you want to convince others of it? Yeah. And that was what Paul's heart was all about. He was convinced that Jesus was Lord. Yeah, right. He was convinced that the kingdom of God in heaven was on earth and that he was in it and his job was to pull people in it. But how did he do that? He had a debate with people. Mm. He had to convince others of their other backgrounds to get into Christianity. Yeah. See, during this time, you had the number one religion of Judaism, right? They only believed in God. They, believed, they didn't believe in Jesus. And his only objective was, how can I convince these people that believe in God, they believe in the Old Testament, the Torah, how can I convince them that this man Jesus actually came and fulfilled every prophecy about him? Yeah. It took debating. It took understanding. Come on, bro. What did Paul not have? Ignorance. Because how can he be a great debater when you don't know the very knowledge of God? See, we can debate all day about all these other things, but the Bible, but God says it's kind of foolishness if you're not talking about me. Ooh, and nothing wrong with playing sports, having entertainment, but at the end of the day, does that really matter? No, it's all it comes down to, do I know God? Do I know his word? And do I know how to debate it? Paul was looking for future leaders, and that's what I'm looking at here tonight. Future leaders all around the campus ministry come into a Devo, which you could be doing something else with your time. But you came here to learn. You came here to apply. So hopefully walking out of here makes a decision. How can I become a debater for God? Learn the truth so you can be confident and deliver it to people. It says in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? See, when you look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what will you see Jesus doing? Debating, Debating preaching, convincing. And then what he would do, he was going against two different groups. 
the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Yeah. They were always trying to question him. But then he silenced one, and then another group came. Yeah. And they tried to question him, but you never question the man. Yeah. Right. Jesus always refuted them. Just like how you saw some refute right here. Usually a good debater will stay on topic. A bad debater starts attacking the person. Well, what do you think happened to Jesus? Every time he preached, it would divide the crowds. And the people eventually killed Jesus. So what do you think could happen to somebody that wants to follow Jesus? What could happen to you? Same thing. Maybe people make fun of you for wanting to follow Jesus. People are going to slander you, trying to bring up your old life, but they don't really know your new life. But you look at it is Jesus was the greatest debater of all time. Paul followed in his footsteps in the same way us here tonight. We got to learn how to obey God's truth. And tonight we're going to discuss two, I would say, controversial topics tonight. But the goal of the debate is simple, to do what the Bible says. Yeah. Wow. The title of the lesson for tonight is The Great Debate. Come on, come on, come on. The Great Debate. You ready for these two topics? Let's go to Luke 13. Luke 13. Take us there, bro. Come on. When we look at Christianity, these, I believe, are the two like most controversial topics in Christendom. The first one is the debate of real repentance. The deal, the debate of real repentance. In the Bible, the word repentance is found 75 times in the New Testament. And right here, Jesus has given us a good example of what repentance should look like. Luke 13, verse 1. The Bible says, Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So Jesus is using an illustration right here of events that happened where people were in a tower and it fell, right, and people died. And, and the Jewish people had this false, re, false narrative. Like, if you, did, if, you, if you sinned, if bad things happened to you, because you probably sinned. Wow. So what does that imply? We, we were asked ourselves, like, why does bad things happen to good people? Yeah. But according to Jesus, is there such thing as a good person? Wow. No, because what do we all have in common? Sin. Sin. The, the principle that Jesus is teaching us is we got to live a lifestyle of repentance. Yeah. Jesus doesn't show favoritism. He expects us to follow him on his terms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jesus made it very clear there's no such thing as a good person. Because what do we uh, base goodness off of? Our own morality yeah. or our upbringing, right? But there's no like moral compass to decide what is truth. Right. But what we're holding tonight is the absolute truth. Yeah. This thing's been around for ye- thousands of years. And it's never been proven to be wrong, but it's been proven to be very challenging to, to do. Yeah. Right. You know, the Bible is written on a sixth grade reading level. So it's not hard to understand what Jesus is saying here. Mm. It says you've got to truly repent. Yeah. And that's where we kind of get like a little lost because the world can teach us another version of what repentance looks like. Yeah. See, the world says repentance is you just ask for forgiveness. That you feel sorry for the wrong that you do, so you ask Jesus for forgiveness. Is that what the Bible teaches, though? Well, the word repent in the Greek, because if you understand your Bibles, you have the Old Testament written in Hebrew and the New Testament written in Greek. The word repent means metanoia. Metanoia means the journey of changing one's mind, heart, self, or the way of life. So it's not asking for forgiveness. Jesus is like, dude, just turn away from your sin. Do a 180. Makes sense? But can somebody repent of their sins if they don't know what sin is? So I'm saying we live in a state of age of ignorance. We're like, we just have this own like idea what's right and wrong. But when you get in the, in the very words of God, God will tell you straight up. And it's going to challenge you to the core if you're never taught this early on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's go to Matthew 3. Right. Matthew chapter 3. Well, let's continue. Like, what does real repentance look like? 
Matthew 3, let's look at verse 1. It says, Matthew 3, verse 1. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of the one calling the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brought up vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Wow. And do not think you get yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow. wow. So now we have Jesus' cousin, Johnny, preaching about repentance. He's out there in the middle of nowhere. Preaching, right? Calling yeah. people to repent. Come on, bro. And there's many people coming to him confessing their deepest, darkest secrets, and they're getting baptized in the Jordan River. Yeah. But then who all of a sudden comes up to question Jesus? The Pharisees. Because oh. they understood something. They understood yeah. the Old Testament that there was going to be a prophet to come and start preaching about the kingdom of God. Yeah. And then John looks at them and says, Who warned you to escape the judgment? Wow. Well, what do you just learn? How to escape the judgment? We'll talk about that in a minute. But he says, if you really want to escape judgment, you've got to produce fruit and keep it with repentance. Wow. The false narrative of repentance is I'm just going to stop sinning. That is not repentance. It's about start living like Jesus. That is biblical repentance. You've got to start doing the good that Jesus did. Because what good does it do anybody if you just stop sinning? Mm. Like, what am I doing now? Yeah. No, like, the moment you, like, stop, like, when you resist the sin, you should start living for him. Like, you should start living for Jesus. And you should start producing fruit, though. Does that make sense? It says produce fruit and keep it with repentance. So if you look at an apple tree, what are you going to find? Apples. In the same way, if you look at a true Christian... You should see fruit, spiritual fruit. You should be more loving, more kind, more patient. Don't keep records of wrong. But there should be not even a hint of sin in your life. Does that make sense? Like if you believe in Jesus, but you're living in sin. That's a contradiction. That's called hypocrisy. I don't know about you, but I grew up going to church. But it never changed my life. I always believed in Jesus, but it did not change my life. It was only until I sat down and studied what the Bible actually said. Yeah. I didn't know what sin really was. I had an idea. I grew up thinking, you know what? Yeah, that's probably a bad thing. But you might have that thought for a second. But if you don't have like a conviction to back that up, you're going to continue to do that thing because it makes you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was said earlier, like, think about pornography. That's a billion do dollar organization. Is pornography saving anybody? No. What is it producing, though? Evil. Destruction. Yeah. Evil. Yeah. Separation. Yeah. Weirdness. Yeah. People that are in that, when people do that, they're just weird. Yeah. They're just like, they're like, they're, just, they're like socially awkward because they're so in darkness. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. The, world, the world is a dark place. Should I keep digging and digging? Like, That's think about right. drug abuse. Yeah. Like, students on these campuses. They this, they're so stressed out, so let me just pop a pill so I can focus. Dang. Why? So you can get, like, that good grade? Like, at the end of the day, like, what are you going to be known for? Yeah. A good grade? You graduate at Stanford? Great job. Like, is that the meaning of life? Graduating at a university? Yeah. Is it getting married, having kids? Is that, the, is that the pinnacle of life for you? It's when you actually learn how to truly repent. That's where freedom comes. Yeah, bro. But I think a lot of us here tonight don't want to buy into that. Whoa. The Bible actually says repentance brings refreshment. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus knew what, your, what the medicine really was. 
Stop living for yourself. Come on, come on, bro. The moment you see Jesus in the scriptures, like I did almost 11 years ago, it changed my life, guys. I kid you not. I was living a, like a life that it was very dark. I was very depressed, very lonely. I was trying everything I could to find happiness and fulfillment. Relationships were a big one. If I just had Mrs. Wright, I'd be happy. No, even when I had a relationship, I was miserable. I was depressed. I felt so empty inside. Because why? I turn on the Netflix uh, movies and like, oh, if I just had that because they're happy on the movie, that must be true. But then I get it. I'm just as messed up. You know, it comes, you know, you're in a bad situation when pleasure itself does not satisfy you anymore. I think some people here tonight are, I think there's some people here tonight that are numbed out. They're so numbed out. They don't feel anything. God sees it and God wants to fix it. But are you going to open the, the arms up and say, hey, teach me? Yes. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Think about it. God already came to this earth one time yeah. Yeah. to save the world. Yeah. How do we know that? Well, if you look at Trevor's neck, he has a necklace called, with a cross on it. So we know Jesus came and died on a cross for our sins. He's already opened his arms for you. But you know he's coming back one day, right? Yeah. You think he's going to save you? Oh. If you didn't make him Lord now... It's not me a great day up there. <laughs> See, God wants to know right now, do you actually truly repent? Wow. Or are you trying to have one foot in Christianity and one foot out? Hey. That life is miserable, actually. Yeah. Trying to live for God in the world, too, it's like suicide. Yeah. I don't wish that on anybody. Mm. Don't try to be a Christian. Just be a Christian. Wow. Yes, See, when you become a Christian, it doesn't mean you'll be perfect. Yeah. No, you actually understand that you're jacked up. Yeah. And now you know that you need a Savior. Yeah. But there's so many people that are so arrogant. Like, oh, no, I can do this life without, without God. Yeah, I see where you're at in like 10 years. 15 years, 20 years. Look at the world. The world is chaotic. Yeah. Turn on the news, man. You're like, dude, I'm shutting that off. That's why people don't live in repentance. They live for self. But this room right here, you guys have the cure. But just like earlier, it took guts to come up here and do a little debate about topics that you should know. (laughs) But imagine when you allow the Bible to really penetrate through your heart. The Bible is a double-edged sword. It's meant to cut your heart. It's meant to break your heart. It's meant to call you to fall in love with God. I think there's so many people here that just want it so bad. But they're letting fear stop them from committing all in. If that's you tonight, I'll encourage you. You're in a safe place tonight. You're in a room full of people that actually found freedom. They found healing. You found people that have overcome. Talk to anybody in this room that studied the Bible. And they'll tell you their life story like this. You're like, man, this is kind of weird. Everyone sounds the same. Yeah. Because Jesus saved us. And he's trying to save you as well. But here's the thing. This message is going to do three things. You're going to hear this message. Like, re- repentance? I don't want to repent. I'm young. YOLO. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that's true. It's true. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of young cats in here. I was I was 23 when I studied the Bible. But I understand. I lived my life very messy. And it took me 23 years to learn that, hey, how I'm doing things isn't the best. And I know in your mind, like, dude, my life is going nowhere. God is calling you to make a decision. But the three things that's going to happen when you hear this message is you're going to run out of here like, dude, that was weird. That message was loco. Like, I don't want anything to do with what he just said. I'm going to go bury my head in the sand and just keep doing what I'm doing. And then maybe God has to come back five, ten years later when you're more broken and messed up. Or you're going to be like, bro, you got to repent. You just got to believe. Maybe you're going to start persecuting. Like, bro, you're a false teacher. You don't know your Bible. All right, well, I'm here. You know, I'm here to sit with anybody that wants to learn God. Paul, you look at anybody in the Bible, they were confident in what they believed in. Do you think you want to go toe-to-toe with Jesus as debating the scriptures? About Paul? No, but if you be a disciple, they should go toe-to-toe with the scriptures. There's nobody out here that's going to sit down with me and show me something I don't know. Because this is my life. I read the Bible, I apply it every single day. That is a powerful individual. And I'm looking at people that are so powerful, but they don't even know it. If you truly believe the Holy 
Spirit is inside of you. And that God has entrusted you with the scriptures. You should bring change. Not conform. Some of us only come out to things because we have a buddy out. But are you coming because Jesus is Lord? People come and go. But Jesus always remains. I'm here for God. I'm here to praise God. I'm looking for those who want to be spiritual revolutionaries to stand up and look at the society. I don't want to be another statistic. I want to change that. Well, it takes with changing yourself so you can change the environment. So if you're here tonight, make a decision. Not to persecute, not run away, but have the guts to actually really repent so you can experience true refreshment. So, again, repentance, I think most people will have it on straight. Like, you got to repent, right? You, gotta, you can't live a certain way. But let's look at the second topic. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, point number two is the baptism debate. The baptism debate. Baptism is very controversial. You know, all around the world, people have their views, they have their opinions of what baptism is. But let me ask you this. Do you want someone's opinion of baptism, or do you want Jesus' very answer? Come on, yeah, I'm not the smartest guy. I just read a book. You know, it says what it says. I just do what it says. Right. The baptism bait. The word baptism, baptize, or baptizing appears over 90 times in scriptures. Would you say that's pretty important? Yeah. All right. You with me? Luke chapter 3. Let's look at verse 3. So this is a, another parallel account we just read. But you might get like a little more insight of what John is preaching. Verse 3. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Did you catch that? So when do you get your sins forgiven? Ooh, okay, that's pretty important. Let's keep reading. As we're in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one call in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brought of vipers, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit and keep in repentance, and do not begin to say yourself, and we understand the rest. So the same account, but now there's some more details that was missing in the book of Matthew. Right. What was John actually preaching? He's preaching repentance, yes, but he's also preaching about baptism. And the moment your baptism, according to John, is the moment you get your sins forgiven. Now you have understanding. It says the Pharisees came because they wanted to be baptized by John. They actually wanted to be saved. But he says every mountain will be made low. Well, what do you think that's talking about? Pride. The biggest thing that keeps people out of heaven is self-righteousness and being prideful. And being arrogant. Religiosity does not save you. It's being broken and accepting the fact that I'm not God. See, when you live like that, when you live broken, you can learn the best. When it comes to Christianity, when you're broken, you actually will learn the best. Well, drop down. Let's look at verse 3. Well, what we understand when we look at the, pa- the passages, Jesus himself, he's the one that goes to John. He says, hey, I can be baptized by you. And John's confused. Like, dude, you're the Messiah. Why do I be baptized by you? And what does Jesus say? To fulfill all righteousness. And it's interesting. The moment Jesus gets baptized, he comes out of the water. You hear a voice that says, you are my son whom I'm well pleased with, whom I love. Interesting. The first time you hear God's voice tell Jesus that he's his son is at his baptism. So then I thought about it. Well, why is that in the Bible? Well, think about it. In Galatians 3.23, when someone gets baptized, it says they become clothed with Christ, but they become a child of God. So how important is baptism? It's absolutely important. Let's go to Mark chapter 11. Okay, bro, come on. Mark chapter 11. Well, let's look at a debate now about baptism. 
Mark 11. Let's look at verse 27. Come on, bro. Take us there, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. So we understand. John the Baptist preached about baptism. Okay. Jesus himself got baptized. He preached about baptism. Yeah. Well, let's see what happens right here in Mark 11, verse 27. Come on, bro. It says, They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests that teaches the law and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. See, Jesus is slick. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, well, hmm. If we say from heaven, he will ask them, why didn't you believe him? But if you say of human origin, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, uh, we don't know. <laughs> smart, smart. Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Amen. See, Jesus is slick, right? <laughs> so they asked him a question, they like, questioned his authority. So Jesus is like, all right, I'll, tell, I'll give you the answer, but you got to tell me then. You answer this question. Oh, for sure, we're Pharisees, we know everything. John's baptism. Was it from heaven? Was this a godly command? Or was it just human origin? And they had a little huddle up like, say this. Yeah, no, can't do that. Say this, we're probably going to get beat up. We don't know. Then I'm not telling you anything. Dang! Again, what is Jesus debating? Baptism. It's the number one most talked about, debated topics in the Bible is baptism. Wow. Do we need it? Right. The world says it's just a symbol. Mm. People say you get baptized to just demonstrate that you're saved. Mm. These, are, these are what people say. This is what churches say. But again, these are all opinions. Where is truth? Right. In the Bible. Yeah. We got to look at the Bible like, okay, well, what is truth? Well, there's an argument that says, well, what about the thief on the cross? You guys ever hear about the thief on the cross? Jesus is dying, the thief, right? And people argue, the thief, you know, Jesus looked at him and saved him. That's it. Yeah, that's right. That's good. But again, you got to know your Bible. What does Matthew 9 say? Come on. Write this down. Matthew 9, verse 6. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. So, imagine what did we just learn about Jesus. It says he has all authority in heaven and on earth to forgive sins. So when he's on the cross, does this man need to get baptized? No. 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 no who's there? Jesus. Jesus is there. So if I wanted to become a Christian and get my, my sins forgiven, well, I got to find Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, where you at, man? <laughs> well, where's Jesus? He's in heaven now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what did he leave us? Okay, what do I got to do? What also came from heaven? John's baptism. Oh. Interesting. Let's see what Jesus also said in his scriptures. On, Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Come on, bro. Again, I just want to look at the Bible. I want to have deeper insight what Jesus wanted us to really do while we're on this planet. Let's go, Tyler. So the second argument becomes the baptism. They would say, well, baptism is just a work. You can't work to be saved. That's true. You don't work to be saved, but you got to have a saving faith. Yeah. Right? Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Come on, bro. The Bible says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elementary spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity live in bodily form. And in Christ, you've been brought to fullness. He's the head over every power and authority. In him you're also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. When? Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you're also raised with him through your faith, in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So what did we just learn? 
It says when we actually decide to come to study the Bible, we truly repent. We see the way we got to go. And we actually get baptized. The Bible says your old life is getting cut. Circumcision. Spiritual circumcision is happening. You're getting cut. And you're coming up a new creation. Your sins are forgiven. But did you see who's doing the working, though? Uh, it's actually God working at your baptism. Yeah. So is baptism a work? No. Not according to scriptures. It's actually God working in your life. You're allowing him. You have faith in him to do what God wants you to do. This is what the Bible says. So the thief, yeah, the thief didn't have to get baptized because Jesus was still there. But baptism is participating in the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So even if the thief wanted to get baptized, you couldn't get baptized in the Christ because he was still alive. Yeah. But then the last argument is it's the same. Well, baptism doesn't save you. Again, what saves us is Jesus. Yeah. And what he tells you to do. Yeah. Let's go to 1 Peter. Come on. Come on. Baptism does not save you. Okay, let's see what the scriptures say. 1 Peter chapter 3. Come on, bro. Again, I'm just looking at scriptures. Our job is not being religiously prideful. I'm like, you know what? Man, that's not what my pastor taught me. Who cares about your pastor? What does the Bible tell you? It's very clear. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water, talking about Noah's flood water, symbolizes what? Baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, baptism is safe. It literally says baptism saves. Yeah. Well, why does it save you, though? Because your sins are forgiven. Wow. There was a wall of sin that separated you from God. Jesus came to offer salvation. And he says, hey, here it is. Take it. How do I take it? Repent first, and you got to get baptized. And then the wall goes down. Yeah. You go from darkness into light. It says you have a clear conscience now. Well, why would you have a clear conscience? Because you are forgiven by God now. You think about that. Because when we sin, we kill our conscience. We steer our conscience. And now we need a Savior. The moment you repent and get baptized, your sins are washed away. Amen. The, by, the baptism actually saves you because why? Jesus said it would. Because yep. that's the moment I'm going to forgive all your sins. Right. Does that encourage you if you're tonight if you've been baptized? Yeah. Yeah. But then you're probably here tonight like, oh, crap. Oh. I've never been baptized before. Oh. Well, that's why God had you, can't, got you here tonight. So you can hear a message. Come on. So your heart can be moved by the message. Not about what I'm saying, but what the Bible is showing you tonight. Yeah. Yeah, come on, bro. Well, if you're still not convinced, right? well, who wrote First Peter? Peter. So he's talking about baptism that saves you. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is the first gospel message. Acts chapter 2. This is the same Peter who just was preaching, or who's just writing 1 Peter. Now he's here preaching to many people like I am right now. Acts 2, look at verse 36. Therefore, that all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Let's pause there. So Peter is preaching and holding everybody responsible for killing Jesus. Right. Well, how can everybody be responsible for killing Jesus? Yeah. They weren't there. Like, not everybody was there putting the nails in his wrists and his feet, putting the crown of thorns on his head. How is everyone responsible for killing Jesus? Mm-hmm. We all have sin. Yeah. Come on. Remember in the first point, there's no such thing as a good person. We all have sin. Yeah. You may be, like, more morally better than other people, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, in the eyes of God, we all have sin. Yeah. yeah. And sin separates us from God. That's why we need a Savior. If you think you don't have sin, it actually says in 1 John that you call God a liar. Because now you're putting yourself in the same position as Jesus. Do we have any other real Jesuses here? I'm not, gonna, I'm not claiming that at all. You know? But right here, Peter is calling everybody responsible for killing Jesus. 
And the only few are going to respond it the right way. Wow. Many others, it's like in this room, is going to walk away and forget this message. Wow. Let's see what happens. Verse 37. When the people heard this, it says they were cut to the heart. Instead of Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What does that sound like? Do they, they, are they taking ownership? Yeah. 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 Their heart is broken. They understand who they are. They're murderers. They look at all the bad that they've done. Dang. The Messiah came. My, man, I've been so depressed and lonely. He came to, to heal me, to cure me. But what do they do? They ask the question. Were they saved yet? No. They're asking, what do we got to do? Sadly, we're like, we're taught nowadays, all you got to do is one thing to go to heaven. No. Jesus says the opposite. There's two things that'll keep you out of heaven. And that's repentance. And the second one is baptism. Mm. Well, let's see what Peter says they got to do to get right with God. Come on, bro. bro. Verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off which is us today for all whom the Lord of God will call with many other words he warned them he pleaded with them save yourself from this corrupt generation those who accepted his message were baptized and throughout about 3,000 were added to the number that day so what do we learn what do we learn Throughout the whole scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, now we got Acts. The theme does not change. He didn't say just believe in Jesus. He didn't say accept him as your Lord and Savior. He didn't say that. He said accept the message. Well, what was the message? That your sin put Jesus on the cross. But, amen, Jesus now is offering you the greatest gift of eternal life. But how do you get it? They ask, what do we got to do? What are the two things Peter says you got to do? Is that what the Bible says? Yeah. That's what it says. So what does that imply? We just got to do what it says. Right. But what would stop somebody from actually doing this? Pride. Say it again. Pride. Pride? Okay, what else? <clears throat> Say it again. Persecution, Persecution yeah. Because why? Maybe you weren't taught this growing up. Maybe you went to church your whole life. But you're taught, all you gotta do is say a prayer, and you know, Jesus lives in your heart, and all that kind of weird stuff. But no, it's not weird stuff. It's like literally simple repent, learn how to actually follow Jesus the right way, yeah. but then get baptized for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Baptism is the most important moment in someone's life mm-hmm. because they become one with God. Yeah. The Holy Spirit goes and lives inside them so they can have the power to overcome everything. Yeah. Maybe there's people here tonight, like, man, I'm trying to overcome. All these other like sins that we talked about earlier. Right. But you haven't overcome them. Well, my Bible says that you actually had the power to overcome anything. Yes, sir. Maybe you just didn't do it right. Yeah. And that's why God has you tonight. Because there's no coincidence with God. God draws people's hearts to bring them in. He gathers people to him. So he can hear the very words of God. Come on, bro. This is what Jesus says in Mark 16, verse 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. What, the Bible is very simple. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to have a life with Jesus, you've got to repent and you've got to get baptized. For me, I was so grateful, you know, almost 11 years ago. On August 25th, 2013, I was baptized into Christ. And you're probably wondering, well, bro, how long? How long did it really take you to choose to live for God? Like I said earlier, you don't got to be perfect. But you got to be willing. Willingness is what God is looking for. Are you willing to have a relationship with me? Despite what people say. Do you just want to look at my scriptures and give me your whole heart? Your whole mind? Your whole soul, your whole strength. Yeah. If you make that decision, what will stop someone getting baptized then? Mm. I want to challenge those who are visiting. You're studying the Bible, and you see what you got to do. Don't, don't wait. Yeah. You know, Paul, his conversion story, if you look at it, he actually waited. He was like, man, I don't know if I could do this, because he was afraid of persecution, like Karina said. But Paul got baptized and what did he do for the rest of his life? 
he debated everybody. You got to do this. You got to experience the freedom I have. You got to experience this family, this purpose that I have. And tonight, I want you to experience the same freedom that I have. And many of these people have in this room. God is calling you, not man. God is calling you to accept this message tonight. But here's the thing. You can't appreciate the good news until you understand the bad news. If you're here tonight and you've never been baptized into Christ the right way, you're not, you're not right with God. This is very controversial. Because then you're going to look at me like, are you, are you condemning people? No. The world's already condemned. God came and brought salvation. It's our job to study it out for ourselves. What you just learned tonight, you got to accept the message. you got to repent, do real repentance. But then you got to get baptized for the forgiveness of sins. But here's the thing. When you come in to the incredible relationship with God, God wants to train you. He wants to mold you. And just like Paul, you can go to every campuses, your workplaces, your family, and you're going to be able to debate to help them go to heaven. This answers the call of your visiting. Repent and get baptized, and to God be all the glory.